Good morning. Let us all uh, come in and settle down as we begin our worship service this morning. Do you love coming to worship the Lord? Yes, wow. May gising na po. One more time. Do you love coming to worship the Lord? Yes. Praise God. I can't d- determine the percentage, but it seems to be high. <laughs> Psalm 26, 27, and 28 actually are psalms focused on the public worship or coming to the sanctuary of God. And Psalm 26 in particular showcases the psalmist's passion for gathered worship. I'll read the the psalm and focus on just a couple of verses to encourage us as we sing this morning. Psalm 26 says, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart, for your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. I do not sit with deceitful men, nor will I go with pretenders. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I shall wash my hands in innocence, and I will go about your altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and declare your, all your wonders. Verse 8, O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. I do not take my soul away along with sinners, nor my life with the men of bloodshed, in whose hands is a wicked scheme and whose right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on a level place. In the congregations, I shall bless the Lord. What a beautiful psalm. And just focusing on two verses, verses 5 and 8, we see the contrast between different assemblies. In verse 5, the psalmist David says, I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. And in verse 8, he says, O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Believers saved by Christ also have a similar instruction from Paul to the book in the book of Romans, in Romans 12, verse 9, which says, Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. And so it is not simply where we are, but what we love. The question is, do we hate the assembly of evildoers? Meron po ba tayong abhorrence for the sinfulness that is in this world? Or perhaps we have been numbed by evil around us. Perhaps something bad happens, something evil is done, and, you know, it's just another day for us. We are not uh, emotionally affected or any of our convictions are not stirred. Brethren, this is an indication that we need to love God more, to know God more in His Word, to know His holiness, and grow in a hatred for evil. Do you hate the assembly of evildoers? Do you abhor what is evil? And is your conviction not to sit with the wicked? And on the other hand, in verse 8, O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Here, Uh, When we think about God's glory, we know that it is a manifestation of His character where His ways are declared, where His attributes are known, studied, loved, rejoiced in. Do you love the habitation of the Lord? Do you love coming to adore Him, to worship Him, to sit at His feet? May the Lord search our hearts. May the Lord indeed revive in us a love for Him a love for His ways, a love 
for His presence. And as we sing this morning and prepare our hearts through these songs, may He be lifted up once more. Let us rise. Adorned with highest praise Robed in regal majesty Extolled for endless days From the highest courts of heaven To the lowest cavern known Jesus, you are Lord of all And we bow before your throne Gentle Rose of Sharon, Emmanuel, God's Son, Tender Man of Sorrows, the True Anointed One, Lily of the Valley, Morning Star so bright, Priceless Lamb of Glory, Eternal Holy Light, Holy Light, resplendent in your glory, adorned with highest praise, robed in regal majesty, extolled for endless days, from the highest courts of heaven, to the lowest cavern known. Jesus, you are the Lord of all, and we bow before your throne. Resplendent in your glory, adorned with highest praise, robed in regal majesty, extolled for endless days. From the highest courts of heaven to the lowest cavern known, Jesus, you are Lord of all. Jesus, you are Lord of all. And we bow before your throne. Praise and save your King. Your throne. Praise and save your King. Your throne. We come to worship you, O oh God. story of passion divine where judgment and mercy kiss where power and love are entwined no tongue can speak this glory no words express the joy you bring as I enter the courts of the King, my desire is to 
to come to this place. My desire is to look on your face, perfect in beauty and truth and love. Your glory shines over all the earth. The King of lavishes grace on in all I do. Lord, my heart is devoted to you. My desire is to come to this place. My desire is to look on your face. Perfect in beauty and truth and love. Your glory shines over dry and weary land where there is no water. You speak to us. You gather your people. There is nothing out there, O oh Lord, that can satisfy our souls, that can give life and wisdom to your people. And so we gladly gather this morning. We come to you for you are our desire. We thank you, O oh Lord, that this desire is a creation of you. We have been newly created through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not to any of our credit. This is not an, an aspect or function of our personality or our orientation. But it is your work of grace in our hearts. You have given us a desire and hunger for you. And far be it from us, O oh Lord, to seek to fill that hunger with worldly things. Far be it from us, O oh Lord, to stir away, Lord, to steer away from your commandments and even your people. And so as we come this morning, Panginoon, help us, O oh Lord, to see that you are our mighty fortress, that you are indeed a refuge to your people. There is no other name given to us that we are to worship and bow down. There is no other Savior but Christ. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevail. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. For earth is not his Our 
striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Does ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is He. Lord, Sabbath His name from age to age the same. Then He must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we We are not for this world. We are not of this world, O oh Lord. You have called us out of this world, indeed, to be a salt and light, to be a witness to the truth that there is only one mighty, mighty fortress. There is only one Savior. And indeed, the powers of evil will be struck down. And this is part of our hope. We look forward to that day when all things will be revealed and made clear, that evil will be destroyed, that sin will be no more, and King Jesus will be recognized and every knee will bow. So as we bow this morning, speak to us, strengthen us, continue to gather us, a people apart of this world, apart from this world, and called to serve you and know you. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. You now take your seats. Good morning. It's a pleasant morning to all of us. Before we continue, we would like to first recognize if we have any first timers who attended Higher Rock Crescent Church. Meron po first timers? Can you please raise your hand? Okay, thank you. Can you please uh, right, uh, stand up so we can. Uh, uh, okay, please stand up. All right, salamat po. Thank you. Uh, for the first timer, we have our brother there. He's raising his hand at the back. Please follow him for a short orientation. And don't worry, your seats will be reserved for you. And you will come back in time for the preaching of God's word. And let us now request the children and the teachers to please stand up so we can pray for you before we send you off to your children's church. Let us all come to God and pray. Dear Father, we thank you for our little ones, for the grace that you have showered upon them so that they will be able to 
listen to your word, to study your word, impress upon their hearts and their minds that they are sinners and they need Jesus Christ for their salvation. We thank you for the teachers. Guide them, give them patience, and help them, Lord, to be able to um, explain properly the truth of God's word. Bless them today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, children, you can go on out to your Sunday class. Um, for our Koinonia time, Sige, palabasin muna natin sila. <laughs> Ayan. All right. Uh, once again, good morning. And for our Koinonia time, I would like for us to consider um, the manner and content of the prayers of Paul for the believers. The manner and content of the prayers of Paul for the believers. From the epistle of Paul, his writings, and the narrative of the life of Paul written in the book of Acts, it is obviously evident that Paul is a prayerful man. And there are many instances in the Bible that Paul prayed in various occasions for the churches he was ministering to. God used Paul mightily in the ministry, and we can learn so many things from his life experiences. For as he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Paul desires that believers would follow his example of a life of faith, prayer, and devotion to God. Not that he already arrived to perfection, but this is a means of grace from God so that believers can take advantage of the lessons learned by Paul as he follows the Lord Jesus Christ to help enable believers to know how to pray for others and what to pray for them. One of the examples of the prayer of Paul for the saints can be found in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 to 18. We will be reading a lot of uh, passages, so please uh, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, and let's read verse 17 to 18. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, will give you spiritual wisdom and revelation in your growing knowledge of Him. Since the eyes of your heart have been enlightened, so that you can know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints. In this very short two verses, the Apostle Paul managed to encapsulate some of the great truths concerning the calling and the life of a believer, which we can safely assume that is almost always the theme of Paul's prayer, not only for the Ephesian church, but for all the churches as well. From this passage, we will find four prayer items, four prayer items that Paul had for the Ephesian church, and these are as follows. The first is, Paul is praying for the Ephesians to have spiritual wisdom, spiritual wisdom. Second, Paul prays for them to have increasing knowledge of Jesus Christ. Increasing. It's not only one time, but it's increasing. Third, in his prayer, Paul desires that they may know the hope of the believer's calling. The hope of the believer's calling. And lastly, Paul prays that they may understand the riches of the glory of Christ's inheritance for the believers or the glory of Christ's inheritance for the saints. I think that is most appropriate. Can you look to, your, to the left and to the right and say, Saint, Saint BJ. <laughs> 
isn't it? Oh, I feel awkward. I cringe. <laughs> but that is re our reality, right? We are all saints. Amen. I intend to cover all these four prayer items, but for lack of time, we will only consider the first item for today and focus our attention on that as we prepare our hearts for our time of prayer later on. We will, however, continue on the other prayer items in the coming Sunday services as we have the opportunity. Now, the first prayer item is spiritual wisdom. What is spiritual wisdom? Yeah, that's a good question. We often heard that, right? Do I have that? Ah, it's the first time to hear that spiritual wisdom. In his commentary to this verse, Dr. Tony Evans does said, and quote, spiritual wisdom can be defined as decision making based on God's point of view. As we come to know God more intimately, we acquire his view of our circumstances and access his spiritual wisdom for our decisions. End of quote. From this definition, we can see that spiritual wisdom or godly wisdom has to do with God's perspective of our life. In short, wisdom is knowing what to do in our life in God's way. In God's way. Where can, where can we find God's pers I'm sorry, perspective? Where can we find His thoughts, His ways, words, and commands? But none other than the Bible, isn't it? The Bible. If we want to grow in spiritual wisdom, if we want to know and grow in spiritual wisdom, we must faithfully and literally read our Bibles. Be acquainted with it. Study it. Meditate on it. And apply the truths in our lives. The book of Proverbs beautifully captured this in chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. It's quite lengthy. And let us read together. Chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. My child, if you receive my words and store up my commands inside yourself, by making your ear attentive to wisdom and by turning your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for discernment, shout loudly for understanding. If you seek it like silver and search for it like hidden treasure, then you will understand how to fear the Lord and you will discover knowledge about God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up effective counsel for the upright and is like a shield for those who live with integrity to guard the paths of the righteous and to protect the way of his pious ones. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity every good way. For wisdom will enter your heart and moral knowledge will be attractive to you. I like what Koji a while ago exhorted us in the worship. Do we abhor evil? Now in this verse, the moral knowledge will be attractive to you. It's the opposite, right? If we are Christian, moral knowledge is attractive to us. And we shun away evil. Now going back to our text in Ephesians, Paul is praying that the Lord will give the Ephesians the spirit of wisdom. And to make them also wise, to understand the great doctrines of the Bible. And these are the truths that can be found only in the Bible. Now, during the time of Paul, the churches are not exempted from problems. They are bombarded with troubles and hardships from inside and outside the church. Hence, it is so critical that believers at the time to have spiritual wisdom to keep themselves away from troubles and from committing sins that is so flagrant in their community. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul rebuked them for not exhibiting wisdom in their behavior, but rather behaving like unbelievers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 to 3, I fed you milk, not 
solid food, for you were not yet ready. In fact, you are still not ready, for you are still influenced by the flesh, for since there is still jealousy and dissension among you, are you not influenced by the flesh and behaving like unregenerate people? Now, these are some harsh words from Paul, do you agree? Very harsh. Some would go on to accuse him of being unloving towards the Corinthian church. But this is rightly so. In context, the church in Corinthian has gone wild in their sins. To the point their behavior is even worse than an unbeliever. It was so shameful. Now this happened because they think and live like an unbeliever. There is what? Jealousy and dissension among them. And these are the manifestation of a fleshly carnal mind. Jealousy and dissension. Now the word dissension as used in this verse is a big ugly word. Okay, please remind yourself, dissension is a big, ugly word. And it means what? Conflict, strife, discord, controversy, contention, bickering, and quarrel, and, you know, similar, similar words that can be, you know, take meaning to this. These attitudes have no place in the church of God, brothers and sisters. For these are the works of the flesh. People who lack spiritual wisdom do not know God's word nor his will. And so live their lives according to the governance of their evil desires and their flesh. Paul clearly explained this in the book of Romans chapter 8 verses 5 to 10. Please open your Bible. There is a beautiful passage Romans 8 chapter uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 5 let's start reading for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit for to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. you have, um, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. In short, brothers and sisters, it is God's will for believers to have spiritual wisdom so that they will be able to know how to live their lives for the honor and glory of God. Spiritual people, they are governed by spiritual wisdom. And this will also help us to grow in our knowledge and understanding of the great truths or the doctrine of God and help us understand more of his will for our lives. As we pray for one another in our time of fellowship, let us pray that each one of us will grow in spiritual wisdom. Let us pray that the Lord will lead us how to live holy and godly that is pleasing to him. Let us also pray that each one of us will seriously, consistently, and faithfully read our Bibles to study and meditate and apply it diligently in our lives. Please get a partner and let us pray for one another later on. <clears throat> okay, please settle down. Okay, let's all rise now to uh, sing this song. Koji, would you lead us? Let's rise. Let's all rise and continue to prepare our hearts for the preaching of God's Word.
It is my meditation all of the day Filling my mind and heart With its light I will know the way Thy word is a lamp unto my feet my bread by thy word shall I live oh how I love thy law oh how I love thy law you are the truth and to every word that you say. Your wisdom is my delight. I will walk in your truth each day. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a my bread by thy word shall I live oh how I love thy law oh how I love thy law thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a Thy word is my bread, by thy word shall I live, oh how I Father, as your people, you have called us to live by thy word. And we thank you for the blessed privilege that you give your congregation that we might turn to your word this morning and allow your Holy Spirit to speak to us, to enlighten us, to give us understanding. Once again, dear Lord, we just commit our time into your loving hands and may your word truly really accomplish that which you set it to do. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Now take your seats. Good morning. And yeah, those of you who are just coming in, I think there are a few seats here. Uh, right there, I think over in the center. A few more here. Right there. Okay, Lord willing, I will be back to this pulpit soon, as the Lord allows. But for the meantime, uh, I've asked uh, Pastor Oscar to uh, give us the Lord's message for this morning. So open your hearts to the Word once again. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of those who were with us in Palawan, I would like to thank all of you for praying for us lifting us up in prayer during the entire time that we were there. Uh, it was really a fruitful, uh, to my mind, a very fruitful ministry and opportunity also for us to see the great work that still has to be done in that area. Thank you for praying for our health. Uh, we are also grateful for the partnership that we have with, uh, with Bond Servants of Love Christian Church. It was such an opportunity and a privilege to fellowship with them. And kami rin po nagaring ng sa higher rock, marami rin pong pagkakataon para mag-fellowship. Um, hindi na po namin pinost yung mga kinain namin. <laughs> Kasi baka isipin nyo na yun yung ibig sabihin ng suffering for Jesus. 
So, puro pictures na lang po ng mga ginagawa ng parang hirap na hirap po kami. <laughs> what word would you use to describe the Christian life? What characterizes the life of the believer in Jesus? If I were to ask you. And of the many things that mark a disciple, what would you say sets him or her apart from the world? I'm sure you can think of many words, many descriptions, uh, and this will distinguish also the church from the rest of the world, the believer from the rest of the world. Today in the Word um, included the words of a third century man who was anticipating his death. He wrote, It's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are the Christians, and I am one of them. Is that your testimony? Is that how you would describe your Christian life? Is this what characterizes the life that you have as a believer in Jesus? Is this one of the things that set you apart from the world? I wonder about joy when I was preparing to study the passage. When we think of the many graces of new life, I wonder how many of us think of joy. I mean, you might think of faith. Yeah, sure, right? You might think of hope. Uh, the believer's hope. And that would not be wrong. And you would think of justification, peace with God. You would probably think about redemption, forgiveness, adoption, those blessings which uh, we come through our union with Christ. No of other words. And you would not be wrong. But I wonder how many of us would think of the word joy. After all, the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 5.22 that, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then joy. He mentions joy. What kind of joy is this? What kind of joy is this? Now, Paul tells us that this joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Uh, singular lang po yung tinukoy ni Pablo. Fruit of the Spirit. So kasama po siya dun sa kaloob ng Banal na Spirito. And if we consider the context, we understand that this joy is of the Spirit and not of the flesh. As such, it is not a state that I can work up myself into by some sheer force of my will. No. The fruit of the Spirit is not natural, and that means not everyone has it inside them. The fruit of the Spirit is natural in that it is found in all who are truly in Christ. Likas po sa mananampalataya yung kagalakan na tinutukoy po ni Pablo. Now, it is supernatural in that it is brought about in us by someone else, not us. This fruit is the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Listen to what J.C. Ryle wrote. The spirit never lies dormant and idle within the soul. He always makes his presence known by the fruit he causes to be born in heart, character, and life. The fruit of the spirit, says St. Paul, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and such like. Quoting Galatians 5.22. J.C. Ryle continues, where these things are to be found, there is the Spirit. Where these things are wanting, men are dead before God. The Spirit is compared to the wind, and like the wind, He cannot be seen by our bodily eyes. 
But just as we know, there is a wind by the effect it produces on waves and trees and smoke. So we may know the spirit is in a man by the effects he produces in the man's conduct. It is nonsense to suppose that we have the spirit if we do not also walk in the spirit. Galatians 5.25 we may depend on it as a positive certainty that where there is no holy living, there is no Holy Spirit. The seal that the Spirit stamps on Christ's people is sanctification. As many as are actually led by the Spirit of God, they and they only are the sons of God. Unquote. That's a very important reminder. The fruit of the Spirit is something which the Spirit brings about in the believer's life. Those who do not have the Spirit of God do not bear the fruit of the Spirit. In the earlier verses, Paul addressed the Christians upon whom the Holy Spirit abides. Let me read Galatians 5, 16 to 21. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, Paul says. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the contrast is in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So the believer in Christ is instructed to live according to the Holy Spirit. In doing so, the Christian does not satisfy the desires of the sinful flesh. Here, the Spirit's desires and fleshly desires are described as being in direct opposition to one another. There is a conflict. But Paul makes it very clear that we who are in Christ are led by the Spirit. This is what sets us apart from those who are not in Christ. They do not have the Holy Spirit of God at work in them. You see, there are works of the flesh, deeds of the flesh, listed in verses 19 to 21, which characterize unbelievers. Paul wants Christians to understand that they have no business pursuing these things. To engage in those things is evidence that you are not a true believer. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 11 reads, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Let's pay close attention to what he says. And even the next verse, verse 11, because Paul says here, And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So, as he wrote that letter, the Apostle Paul was... Clearly, clearly had in mind those who were among them, the members who were going to be hearing the reading of his letter. Many members of the church who used to be characterized by such sinful behavior were wonderfully saved by Christ. 
How is that possible for someone enslaved by sin to break free from its bondage? Where they were set free by the wonderful work of the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Jesus. And I would like for us to consider the Holy Spirit's work of joy in the believers. For example, in Acts 13, 44 to 52, we have the narration um, that the Apostle Paul, after preaching before the citizens of Antioch, was again uh, asked to teach God's word to the many people in the city who were gathered to hear God's word. Well, the Jews jealously spoke against Paul's message, and what they did was they reviled Paul. Paul and Barnabas admonished them, saying that God's word had been spoken to them, that is the Jews, first. The Jews' rejection of the gospel meant that they were unworthy of eternal life. This meant that it was time to bring the light of the gospel of salvation in Christ to the Gentiles. This was Paul's and Barnabas' announcement. So the Gentiles rejoiced and they glorified God's word and the scriptures tell us, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. That's the sovereign work of God. God appoints and He grants the gift of faith that people might believe in Christ and have eternal life. The word of the Lord, after this, kept spreading throughout the whole region. But did that stop the Jews? No. The Jews stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the district. Tama na yun? Okay na yun? We already tried. Let's stop. Is that what Paul and Barnabas did? No. They shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. They go to the another place. And here, in verse 52, Acts 13.52, we note the narrative, the writer, Luke, says the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. You see, in spite of opposition, in spite of this persecution that they faced, the believers had joy in the Spirit. Isn't that amazing? What kind of joy is this? After explaining God's gracious plan of salvation and what it meant for the church, Paul described his ministry in this way in Romans 15, verse 8 to 13. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, that is the Jews, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs way back in the Old Testament. And in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Wow. As it is written, Paul quotes the Old Testament, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. And then he greets them, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. It's interesting that in the preaching of the gospel, in the declaration of salvation in Jesus to the other nations, that is to the Gentiles, it is a call for them to rejoice, to be joyful. Because it is also God who grants joy. It is a joy in the gospel which calls other people to find joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see how this joy even advances through great affliction and persecution. Right now, the children are going through the book of Acts, sa Sunday school po. And it's very noticeable that you have the preaching of the gospel and then persecution. Preaching of the gospel and then persecution. Walang tigal rin po yung persecution. Pero patuloy lang po yung pagpapahayag ng Ebanghelyo. Why? There is this joy which God grants believers. 1 Thessalonians 1.6 And you became imitators of us, Paul, told Paul writing to the Thessalonians, and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction. It is through difficulty of 
affliction, opposition, persecution, they receive the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. That is how believers come to Christ through the Holy Spirit. And even if it is most difficult, when there are many challenges, they receive the word with joy. The joy of the Holy Spirit is joy in the gospel of Jesus. And how does this figure in Paul's letter to the Galatians? You see, from the very beginning of the letter, we see that Paul's apostleship is bound up with Christ. Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to verse 5. What does he point to? God gloriously raised Jesus from the dead, and that is reason for us to rejoice, right? We have a risen Christ. We have a living Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. So this was no accident. The death of Christ is no accident, but was accomplished according to the will of our God and Father. And this is his plan coming out. Substitutionary atonement. The idea that Jesus died in our place and took upon himself the punishment for our sins is reason for us to rejoice, to be joyful. This is why we rejoice in the Lord because it is to him that glory is due forever. The gospel was the very center of Paul's life because in it he came to know Christ's grace. If you look at Galatians 1, 13 to 16, this is his testimony. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the tradition of my fathers. That's what he was like. That's how he began. He was a persecutor. What changed? And why was the gospel most glorious for Paul? Paul wrote, but when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, dun pa lang sa first part po ng kanyang sentence, we see the grace of God. What a testimony to the grace of God. The former persecutor of the church was called by the grace of God. Christ revealed himself to Paul that Paul might preach Christ to the Gentiles. That is a reason to be joyful and to rejoice para kay Paul. It changed and transformed his life. Listen to the testimony of this Jew who came to know salvation in Jesus. Galatians 2, 15 to 21. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. This is what this Jew came to understand, came to realize. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. That changes everything. It changed everything for Paul. And here is the life-changing message of the gospel. Here is his testimony. And here is every believer's testimony. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. It is the gospel. Here is the good news of Jesus. And this is what transformed Paul's life from being a persecutor of the church to an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. What kind of joy is this fruit of the Spirit? First of all, it is joy in salvation. We saw that already in the previous verses. But I want you to note how the Spirit's work in Christians is also fleshed out in other portions of the Galatians. 
this joy and salvation. In Galatians 3, 1 to 9, Paul points, he directs attention, he addresses the Galatians as being foolish. And he addresses them as being having been bewitched. Why? Because they had, in the preaching of the gospel, come to understand Jesus Christ as publicly portrayed, crucified. Then he asks, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Of course, the answer is, they received the Spirit by hearing with faith, not by the works of the law. So this is the foolishness now of the Galatians who are turning away from the gospel of the grace of Christ. They began by the Spirit. He asked, are you now being perfected by the flesh? That's the wrong way to live. If you have in fact been begun by the Spirit, you continue in the Spirit. In verse 5, he says, It is God who supplies the Spirit to you, and it is God who worked miracles among them. By, was it, he asked them, was it by the works of the law, or was it by hearing with faith? So here we see the work of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit in their lives at the very beginning, and He should be there continually. There has to be this dependence upon the Spirit by faith. And Paul points to the gospel saying, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, this is justification by faith alone, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. So here, in this portion of scripture, Paul is pointing to the believers, those who have believed in Jesus Christ as being sons of Abraham as if to distinguish them from the other Jews who are descended from Abraham physically, but who do not have faith in Christ. Because he says, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham. So preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Very important. Because there was already good news there. Saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. That's us. We are blessed also, through Abraham's seed, and that is Jesus. Paul explains, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. In Galatians 3, 13 to 14, Paul presses, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. This is the crucifixion. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. The spirit which is promised was not only something for the Jews or for the nation of Israel. Here we receive it. Those of us who are Gentiles. And I think, wala naman po yatang Jew na nandito. Okay? This is the promise that is also given. And we partake of that promise through faith in Christ. Through Christ's work, we receive the promise of the Spirit. And again, the Christmas passage, Galatians 4, 4 to 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has spent the, sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Let me point out here how important it is to understand the difference. You see, what is proclaimed here is not Judaism. It is not what Paul used to believe about God or his word or his work. Because here it is clearer now that the Old Testament was testifying to the gospel which is preached here now. It is the same gospel. It is the same saving grace of God. It points us to Christ and his sufficiency. And in the coming of Christ, in this part of the fulfillment of it, we have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, in our hearts. This is the means by which we are able to call out to God in faith. In fact, we call Him Father. Galatians 4, 27 to 31. 
Now, this is also amazing because what Paul does here is he points to a passage in the Old Testament. He says, For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. He makes the comparison between, uh, between Abraham's to uh, his wife and then his concubine and the results of those. And he says, Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so he points already to the believers, those who were in Christ as being born according to the Spirit, he's saying those who are persecuting us, these Judaizers persecuting us, are, just, are acting just like Ishmael. And then he says, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Again, making a difference. All those, all those who have trusted in Christ are saved and are considered children of promise, children of Abraham. And these Jews who were telling the Gentiles, you have to be circumcised, you have to follow the Mosaic law, you have to be faithful to this. If you don't keep these things, you cannot belong to the people of God. He's saying, no. They are actually, like in the Old Testament, Ishmael who persecuted Isaac. So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. In Isaiah 54, 1, it's very interesting that what, uh, uh, initially, what Paul said, um, as he cited it, is rejoice. In Isaiah 54, 1, in place of that, it is sing. Sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. You have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. So, interesting. Joy, rejoicing. Here's our reason to joyfully sing as we do as believers. Because we have received, through the gospel, salvation in Christ. We now belong to God. We are His children. And that is why in Galatians 5, 1 to 9, Paul presses and explains that it is for freedom that Christ set us free. We have been set free. We have been liberated. And he calls them to stand firm and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. What's he referring to? Legalism. Going through the law, thinking that by fulfilling the law, you can be saved. And that is, that is a problem here. And that is the constant challenge in his letter to the Galatians. He says, look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. Now, let me clarify as I did before. This doesn't mean that it's wrong to get circumcised. It is wrong to be circumcised according to the ceremonial circumcision, thinking that through the ceremonial circumcision of the Jews, one is going to be declared righteous and saved. Yun po yung pagkakamali ng iba. Paul said, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law, by doing good works, or thinking that by observing the Mosaic law, you can declare yourself righteous. In fact, he says, if you continue in that path, of observing the Lord and thinking you, by keeping the law, you can be made right with God. You have fallen away from grace. You have not understood the grace of God. You have not apprehended the, the grace of God. You do not know the gracious salvation of God in Christ. For through the Spirit by faith, he said, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Here is the path. Here is the gospel. What's the challenge here? He says, In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. You see, the challenge of legalism or even work or works righteousness or trying to work our way up to the point that we can be acceptable before God is wrong. It is not the gospel. And if we turn to that after having heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are turning away from grace. We are turning away from salvation. And that's why Paul addresses them saying, You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you, he says. 
Isn't that amazing? Now, before we, because we started out talking about joy, right? And then what does this have to do with joy? Let me say that here, as Paul addresses it, there, there are no joyful legalists. There are no joyful legalists, right? Kaya yung, hindi naman po sa naniniwala po tayo sa sine. But when we watch these movies where the Pharisees are featured, how, how do they look? They're very formal and all. They're very sour and um, may, may pagka-ogre yung dating. Parang ako kapag may binubuli po ako. <laughs> uh, and, and, and they're very difficult to talk to. There's, you don't see them. They're not portrayed as people who smile, right? There are no joyful legalists. What does that mean? I'm not just talking about those who are Jews or Pharisees or scribes, even Sadducees, the, the Jewish leaders, even during Jesus' day. I'm talking about people today who hold on to what they think is a way of salvation by being good or thinking that by keeping the Ten Commandments they can be saved or by keeping a, or having a list of uh, this is what I should do, this is what I should do. If I keep all of these things, I'm right with God. You know, those people, they're not truly joyful. They have no joy. Why? There is no real assurance that they're inheritors of the kingdom of God. They're heirs of the kingdom. There's no assurance for them that they are truly children of God. Why? They can't stand in the scriptures because the scriptures declare to us the gospel, the freedom that we have in Christ. There is no joy for them if every day they're keeping watch about, oh no, I have to do this. I, don't ha- I shouldn't do that. Oh, look at what I've done. And for the Jews particularly, that meant that you had to be constantly aware of what you were doing and then you had to offer the appropriate sacrifices. Where's the joy in that? What kind of joy is this? This fruit of the Spirit. It is joy in salvation, in the gospel of salvation which is found through faith in Christ. This is why, why you also have the Apostle Paul in Galatians very, very protective about the gospel, making sure that the truth of the gospel would abide with the Galatians. Because apart from laying hold of the gospel, there would be no real joy because they wouldn't really be converts. Let me also call attention to something when it comes to joy and salvation. And here I depart for a while from our text. David sinned against God by using his authority as king to get Bathsheba, and he murdered his loyal, faithful soldier, Uriah. David may have gotten what his sinful flesh wanted, but he ended up losing so much more. When the prophet Nathan confronted David regarding his sin, David received the rebuke and repented. And I want you to notice the way David described what he had lost by feeding his flesh and choosing his sin. What do we observe in Psalm 51? Psalm 51. David begged Yahweh to have mercy on him. When what's the basis of begging for mercy? Does David look to himself? No. He pleads with God to have mercy on him out of covenant love. So this is based on God, not on him. David is not asking for mercy as if to say that, Lord, think of all the good I've done for you and for your people. Have mercy on me. That's not what he said. David understood that his transgressions could only be blotted out by the Lord's abundant mercies. David understood that he could neither wash himself of his own iniquities nor cleanse himself from his sins. David knew that only the Lord against whom David had sinned, in whose sight David did evil, only the Lord could forgive David. David came to realize that he was one who has brought forth an iniquity, who was conceived in sin. He was a sinner from the very beginning. People look at the outer person. God delights in truth in the inward being. God teaches, God instructs, God counsels us with wisdom, with understanding, teaching us discernment, teaching us knowledge for our inner person, for our hearts, for our minds, for our souls. 
So David pled with God to purge him, to cleanse him, to wash him, to purify him of sin. You see, David could not do it for himself. And it's not about how bad the sin was, but the fact that it was sin and it was sin against God. And David came to recognize the futility, the vanity, the emptiness, the meaninglessness of his pursuit of sin. You see, one of the things that the foolish enticement of sin took away from David was joy. And David experienced the misery, the trouble, the evil that his transgression, his rebellion, his iniquity, his perversity had brought him. In another Psalm, Psalm 32, David referred to his bones wasting away through his groaning all day long. The heavy hand of God had been upon David the whole day, every day. Sunud sunud po And the trouble to David's soul just sapped his strength and drained him dry. And David knew the misery, the tragedy, the calamity that sin brought. Listen to the desperate cry of David's suffering, languishing soul in Psalm 51, 8, the first part. He said, let me hear joy and gladness. If you understand the context, he's begging, he's pleading with God. Let me hear joy and gladness. It was taken from him. It was stripped from him. What kind of joy is David asking for? There is an acknowledgement of the misery of iniquity, the devastation of transgression. The sin strips us of joy. And this is a confession that agrees with God's word that transgression takes away our gladness. Note that this isn't just any kind of joy and that this isn't just any kind of gladness. I try to imagine what this is like, you know, for David. I mean, he was king. Whatever he wanted to eat, he could have it ordered, right? And then you don't have to have problems with the order on your app. Net. Whatever he wanted, just says it. Walang problema yung pagdating, pagdeliver. But wala, but kulang yung ganito ganyan. Nothing like that. No one would dare, right? But nothing tasted now. That's what I imagine. And then if he wanted to, you know, at, at some point, um, I want some entertainment, I want some music. He had the best instruments in the land, right? And he was a musician. So he leads the band and starts, you know, perhaps uh, on his guitar. What happens? Nothing. He tells everyone to just leave the room because there's nothing. Nothing. And it's empty. Right? In a sense, he got everything that he wanted. But the most important thing, it was taken from him. What had happened? When Yahweh showed his mercy upon his people, what did it mean for them in Esther 8, 16 to 17? It reads, the Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. There's that word pair. And in every province, in every city, wherever the king's command and edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. That kind of joy and gladness, this sense of celebration, knowing God has providentially, mercifully taken away the calamity and destruction which we dread, brings us joy and gladness. I have to ask you, do you know this joy? Do you know this joy? When the people of Yahweh chose hypocrisy, over sincerity, refusing to repent of idolatry and immorality. What happened? Yahweh said in Jeremiah 7, 20 and 34, Behold, my anger and my wrath will be poured upon this place, and I will silence in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land shall become a waste. You know, I try to think about what is probably the most joyous occasion in cultures, you know. Isn't it usually weddings? Masaya yung mga kasalan, hindi po ba? And kahit na 
kahit na nagkuto na po ba tayo sa kasal. <laughs> it, it, it's a happy thing. It's a joyous thing for the, for the church. Even the church. But here, what do we hear? The sovereign Lord himself in holy wrath over sin withheld joy and gladness from his people. And Jeremiah was actually commanded not to lament, not to mourn, not to grieve for the dead, not to comfort or feast with others. Pinagbawalan po siya ng Panginoon. Think about it. The marks of joy perhaps for a culture in the wedding, the bridegroom and the bride, at ayun wala na. There's no reason for people to think of celebrating. In Jeremiah 16:9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will silence in this place before your eyes and in your days the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. No more joyous weddings. It's not na pinagbawalan po ng Panginoon. Wala pong kinakasal. Why would God do such a thing as this? Jeremiah 16, 10 to 13. And when you tell these people all these words and they say to you, Why has the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? What is our iniquity? What is the sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? Then you shall say to them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, declares the Lord, and have gone after other gods and have served and worshipped them and have forsaken me, have not kept my law. And because you have done worse than your fathers, your ancestors, for behold, every one of you follows his stubborn, evil will, refusing to listen to me. Therefore, I will hurl you out of this land into a land that neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods day and night, for I will show you no favor. Ang bigat nun. Do you know this grief? Do you know this sorrow? Do you know this sadness? Because of his people's unfaithfulness, because of their idolatry, because of their iniquity, Yahweh said, no more favor, no more joy. And that's the thing. Eh? You know, the, there are many things that we can try to occupy ourselves with, to, to think that uh, I can be happy, I can be joyous with this, I can, I can enjoy this and that. But imagine if God himself has set himself against you and says, no more joy. No more joy. So as we go back, what kind of joy did David desire? Back in Psalm 51, we will see the joy that David longed for in his prayer. He says in Psalm 51, 8 to 12, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. The New English Translation notes the use of the phrase joy and gladness in verse 8. The language, quote, is metonymic. The effect of forgiveness, joy, has been substituted for its cause. The psalmist probably alludes here to an assuring word from God announcing that his sins are forgiven, a so-called oracle of forgiveness. The synonyms, joy and gladness, are joined together as a hendiadis to emphasize the degree of joy he anticipates. Now, let me be clear. David didn't lose his salvation. He wasn't asking God to save him again. David had lost the joy of his salvation, the joy over his being saved, the joy of experiencing God's forgiveness. Why? By choosing wrongdoing over righteousness, David experienced the anguish, affliction, grief, pain, and woes of wickedness and ungodliness. Now David longed to once again rejoice as one of the redeemed of the Lord. David wanted God, who had brought him pain, to cause the bones he had once broken to rejoice, to sing. I've always found this expression strange. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. You see, only God can bring out rejoicing from broken bones. This could only be possible if Yahweh would grant David assurance of pardon, a pure heart, a new heart. 
David needed to know God's loving, gracious, merciful, comforting, empowering presence by His Spirit again. This would only be possible if the Lord were to restore him, would cause him to return to renew his soul. Then David would once more rejoice in knowing the joy of the Lord's salvation. Do you know this joy? This joy of salvation? The nation of, Yah of Yahweh, the nation of Israel, had turned away from Yahweh to worship idols, to pursue immorality and practice wickedness. And the Lord's discipline came through the devastation of their enemies' assault. But the Lord also promised that the time would come when He would bring about the restoration of His people. In Isaiah 35, Yahweh said, He will make His people glad again. They will rejoice with joy and singing once more. The Lord will make His weak, His feeble, His anxious people know His strength when He saves them. And then their eyes will see, then their ears will hear, and then their tongues will once again sing for joy. God promised in Isaiah 35 verse 10, And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The Lord promised to heal His nation, to restore His people, to rebuild them by cleansing them from their sin. In Jeremiah 33, Yahweh promised to forgive His people's rebellion against Him. The city would be to the Lord a name of joy. And He said in Jeremiah 33, 11, that there shall be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voices of those who sing, as they bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord, give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as at first, says the Lord. You and I need to understand the trouble that our transgression brings. In seeking to satisfy our souls with sin, we suffer under the self-inflicted slavery of sadness and sorrow. God has wired the world so that if we reject His righteous rule, we will be ruined by our own wretchedness. And God works by withholding the wonderful promise of pardon, bringing misery upon those who refuse His mercy. If you have been pursuing the promises of this sinful world, this wicked world, know that their promises are fleeting and they are false. Have you been seeking to satisfy your soul with sexual impurity, immorality, idolatry, adultery, and a host of other iniquities? Have you been setting your heart on more and more of the world's, you know, rewards, riches, and recognition? There is nothing at the end of your search except futility, vanity, misery, meaninglessness, and emptiness. The world may promise you joy, but it cannot deliver. There is nothing there. Brother, there is nothing there. Sister, there is nothing there. But the Lord God is our loving Savior. Jesus Christ came to save those who will confess and repent their sins, believing Him alone for salvation. You see, even pursuing earthly joys, that's not the gospel. Success you know, better relationships, money, power, influence, affluence. That's empty. That's not the gospel either. So whether it's legalism or licentiousness, none of those, neither of those is the gospel. Turn to Christ. Turn to Christ. God showed His love through Christ's death on the cross 
for wicked, weak, ungodly sinners who have rebelled against him. So you now know the joy of one whose sin, whose transgression, whose iniquity is forgiven. What kind of joy is this fruit of the Spirit? It is the joy of salvation, as we saw earlier. It is also the joy in restoration. What kind of joy is this? This is the joy of salvation in, and restoration. This is also the joy of mission. Mission. And this is why we do what we do, by the way. You have brethren who go to Tondo every Saturday. Brethren who go to Novaliches every Sunday. Every Saturday morning rin po, meron pong team which goes up to Nabuklod. And this is why we also had the mission to Palawan. Why do we do that, you know? And, and why is it that people, you know, take time off from work? They actually go on leaves to, for example, as the last week, to go up to, uh, down to Palawan. There's a song written by Stephen Curtis Chapman. I don't think many of you hear him, but I, as I was thinking about the text, I remembered his song. It goes, anybody in their right mind would have given up their preaching and headed for home. They've been warned a hundred times, but something inside them keeps giving them hope. And just when you think they'd be crying, instead of the tears, there's joy in their eyes. And the chorus goes, what kind of joy is this that counts it a blessing to suffer? What kind of joy is this that gives the prisoner his song? What kind of joy could stare death in the face and see it a sweet victory? This is the joy of a soul that's forgiven and free. Of course, he was describing the, the great number of the uh, apostles as they went about their mission. But he focuses in the second verse and says, Anybody else with his pain would want to shake their fist at heaven and give up the fight. Because trouble had been Paul's middle name ever since he'd been captured by God's blinding light. But just when his hope should be dying, if you listen, you'll hear him singing a song. What kind of joy is this? The Father has promised his children. What kind of joy is this that Jesus has come to reveal? What kind of joy could he give hope in this world to someone just like you and me? This is the joy of a soul that's forgiven and free. I've found this joy for my soul is forgiven and free. You see, the joy of salvation and the joy of restoration compels us also to the joy of mission, to bring the gospel to others. And this is why the Apostle Paul was also adamant about protecting the gospel. As he wrote his letter to the Galatians, he was fighting for their joy, not just his. He wanted to let them know that there is joy to be found in Jesus, in the gospel of Jesus. That there is, he's letting them know that you cannot find your joy in sin and licentiousness, and you cannot find your joy in legalism and works righteousness. Joy can only be found through faith in Christ. You think about it. In his letter to the Philippians, and we've been told this repeatedly, what is the repeated theme of this of this letter, right? It's joy and rejoicing, and it's key to understanding it. But, you know, it's not just joy, you know. Some people think, oh, you just have to uh, think of the, think of, think of, ha think happy thoughts, and that's it. You know, have problems, think happy thoughts. You have problems, think of happy thoughts. You have trial after trial, think happy thoughts. You know, think of a better, whatever. But that's not the case, actually, in the letter to the Philippians. The joy of Paul is bound up in the gospel, right? And, and one of the things which has been an encouragement here for Paul, as I, even, as I read Philippians, is because of the partnership, this joyful partnership in the gospel that he had with the Philippians, it just bolstered, encouraged, and buoyed up his joy. 
And that was wonderful. This is something that they encouraged each other with. And you remember the situation with in Philippians, right? Where was Paul when he wrote his letter to the, uh, to the Philippians? This is considered one of the prison epistles, right? Where do you get the joy for that? And why is it that while he's under house arrest, perhaps, and that he's, uh, he's, uh, you have guards you know, with him, and what is he joyful about? Oh, he writes in his letter, they've all heard the gospel. I imagine this, you know, merong shifting, di ba? Na nagbabantay sa kanya. So, anong nangyayari? Kada kwento po ng mga, mga guards, sa ibang guards, uh, do you really want to get, ano, uh, chained to this guy? It, because it seemed that they were, uh, he was not chained to them, they were chained to him. Medyo sila yung napaparusan ng konti. Narinig mo naman, ano yung sinabi niya? A gospel daw eh. No naman. So all of them have heard it. And as far as the Apostle Paul was concerned, this was reason for joy. Joy in the mission. Because even if, you know, to our mind, dapat malaya ka, he should be free to do whatever he wants and preach the gospel here and there. And then he's, you know, under house arrest. He, he's in prison. What happens? You see, the word of God is not chained. And every, everyone who got chained to him knew that, I mean, at some point. And here is... Paul, he's delighting over it. Delighting over the fact that there is joy. There is joy in the mission. Even if there seems to be limitations, bakit ganito yung nangyayari? There was this joy. And the fruit of the gospel, the fruit of gospel joy trumps everything else. And even there in Philippians, we know that uh, there was a problem for the Judaizers, but still in the writing of Paul, he points that the fruit of gospel joy trumps the futility of graceless legalism. What did what we read in 1 Peter 1 to 8? Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him, he, see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. The joy of salvation, the joy of restoration, the joy of mission. And this is also something that we want to be able to share with you, the mission to Palawan. I noticed something about um, coming from there and while we were there, um, Doon po sa aming Viber group, yung chat po namin, uh, those who were sharing their messages were so grateful to the Lord, so thankful. And we were rejoicing over the triumph of God's Word. Pagod kami, pero masaya kami. Because this is born out of that joy which comes from the work of God through His Spirit. Those who engage in licentiousness are not joyful. There are no joyful sinners and transgressors. They don't have true joy. There are no joyful workers of the flesh. You know, those who practice sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, what we read earlier, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. They have no joy. And those who practice envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these are not joyful. They will not inherit the kingdom of God, Paul says. And those who are legalists are not joyful either. There were no joyful Pharisees, Sadducees, Sadducees, scribes, and Judaizers. And even today, those who pursue works righteousness as a way of saving themselves, they are not joyful. They have no joy. They can pretend all they want, but they don't have true joy. Gospel joy trumps graceless legalism and licentiousness. I mean, think about it as he think about Paul's opponents in, in Galatia, for example. Those who he was trying to address, those who he was coming against, the, the Judaizers. Do you think of them as happy people? So I imagine them as this with having this sourness because I mean to think that they don't have the the freedom in Christ to God's grace. Consider also what this means as you recall that we're, as we study the Gospels, remember Jesus' words against the Pharisaic teaching? He addressed them, he, re he rebuked them. Why? They, have, they had no real claim to joy. What kind of joy is this? Not only is this joy of salvation, joy of restoration, and joy of mission, 
it is also the joy in the consummation. Joy in the consummation. Look forward with me to Revelation chapter 19, verse 1 to 10. After this, John wrote, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for His judgments are true and just. For He has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of His servants. Once more, they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen! Hallelujah! And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you His servants, you who fear Him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Is this your joy? Are you looking forward to the great consummation? To the end, when Christ will gloriously Reveal himself to all, and our eyes will behold him. Amen. We will know the blessedness of fellowshipping with him, and this will continue forever. Are you going to be there for this marriage supper of the Lamb? Are you looking forward to it? Maybe you're not. Maybe you don't know. Maybe you want to be there when that time comes. But you don't have joy in the consummation. Perhaps you fear that you won't be there and you will end up suffering in hell in torment forever. And perhaps the commendation of Christ, you know, is there before you. Repent. Turn from your sin. Turn from your unrighteousness. Turn away from your self-righteousness. Lay hold of the promises of Christ. Find your joy in Him. You see, C.S. Lewis wrote, Our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, C.S. Lewis said, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum, because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. But the scripture provides us promises of things which are greater and they are the source of infinite joy. Is this what we are looking forward to, brothers and sisters? Friend, is this what you are looking forward to? There is something else here, and I would like to address my fellow workers, my fellow pastors. There is another joy in Matthew 25, 19 to 23. In this parable, you know, the master who had left to his servants resources and then he returned. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. Say, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, and I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And you also... Uh, and he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Same thing for these two servants. We know about the third servant. So obviously, he was not a true servant. And he was going to enter into what he deserved. 
And that was punishment for his unfaithfulness. But I want you to note this part of the parable, Nephi me, brothers and sisters who serve. Um, the wonderful thing that we have here is the, the commendation coming from the master, saying that we have done well, that we have been good and faithful. We have been faithful even over a little. Enter into the joy of your master. That's what we look forward to. Do you know, he didn't call them by name. I'm not, I'm not I, don't know, I was thinking about this. He didn't call them by name. He called them servant. And think about that. Do you want Jesus to call you by name? By your name? Do you want to be called servant? What a privilege to be called God's servant. Because if you think about it, if you think about it, this is greater than having a name for him to call you servant and to call you to enter into his joy. What are we facing in the ministry, brothers and sisters? What are the difficulties and trials and troubles? Many of these things the others perhaps do not understand, but we do, right? Let us do well. Let us be good in our service. Let us be faithful. And even if we have been given, quote-unquote, little, let us make much of it. And let us long to see, to hear our Master call us to enter into His joy. Isn't that something that you and I look forward to? Bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Lord, apart from the gracious work of your Holy Spirit, we cannot possibly know the fruit of joy in our lives. And we ask you to make this clear in our hearts and our minds that we might know, truly know, the joy of salvation, that there is forgiveness for sin, in the cross of Christ. And if we are believers, but we have fallen into sin, and we are struggling with sin, cause us also to know this, that it is in repenting of sin and finding Christ and laying hold of Christ again in His gospel that we will know joy. There is joy in restoration. And for those of us who need to understand also the greatness of the enterprise of the gospel in evangelism and outreach and mission, Lord, remind us that there is joy in this mission. And you extend this to us. You want us to partake of this great joy. You want us to participate in your great world mission. You want us to see how, even through the little that we do, you are making of it much. Grant us also, Lord, the joy of understanding what it is you're going to bring about in the end, to lay hold of the promise that in that time yet to come, we will find joy in your presence forever. And we will rejoice and we will experience joy unspeakable. So that as we serve, Lord, as we long to minister in your name, and there are times when grief and sorrow and pain come upon us as we serve, help us to see that you are worthy of our work, of our labor, of our ministry. And this great prospect of entering into your joy cause, at, cause that, Lord, to take deep root in our hearts that we will long to hear the first of your commendations that we are your servants, that we have done well, that we have been good and faithful. 
This can only be possible if you sustain us with your joy every day. So we look to you for this. We thank you, Lord, for what it is that you encourage us with through Christ. Amen. Let's sing this song as we continue to celebrate God's goodness through Christ. Let us praise the Almighty for what He has done. He has given you life through the Son. We're a part of the family His love has begun. Let us praise Him for what He has done. Let us praise the Almighty for what He has done. He has given you life through the Son. We're a part of the family His love has begun. Let us praise Him for what He has done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, praise His name. Let us praise Him for what He has done. Let us praise the Almighty for what He has done. He has given you life through the Son. He's uniting His family, making us one. Let us praise Him for what He has done. Let us praise Him. Let us praise Him. praise you, O God, indeed. We thank you for the joy that you have given us through Christ. May this be seen in our lives, O Lord. May you grow the joy that you have given us, and may the world see, Lord, that this can only come from you. May our lives truly testify to our Savior. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen and amen. God bless Paul.